We've got at least one more edition of story time with Pastor Bruce. I enjoy watching those um, YouTube videos and stuff where some uh, guy is speaking in a public auditorium and they have a time, and usually it's a Christian person that I'm watching, and they're arguing for the Christian faith, and then some uh, snot-nosed college student um, gets up to ask a question, and I'm, I'm sorry, that not all college students are snot-nosed, um, <laughs> uh, but some person who is educated well beyond uh, their intelligence, and, and they start with this uh, gotcha kind of question. Oh, yeah, here... Here's why Christianity isn't true. And then they go on and they argue that this is, you know, I've got the answer and they're pretty smug. And then the speaker just turns around and very quickly just shows them that which is unexplainable is explained. And that which is incomprehensible, if you thought about it a little bit, is a lot more comprehensible. And that just gives me great joy. And I hope that someday I get the privilege of doing that <laughs> because that would be fun. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, see something like that today because Jesus is, has, has been facing all these questions from the uh, leaders of Israel, and they've been trying to get that aha moment where they back Jesus into a corner where he incriminates himself, where they have reason to kill him. And the last guy asked, uh, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And in that, there's a, a sense in which maybe he was taking a little swipe at him. He says, I know that there's only one God and no other. And then the next thing Jesus does, it says later as he was teaching the people in the temple, he asked, why do the teachers of religious law claim that the Messiah is the son of David? So now Jesus has turned things around. Now he's backing this person, these people into a corner. And he's going to expand their view of God here. For David himself, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, The Lord, God, said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? The large crowd listened to him with great delight. And then Jesus went after the teachers. And he said, Beware of these guys. We're going to focus on this quote from Psalm 110, though. It's used several times throughout the Bible, and sometimes as we read it, we, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get what he's trying to say. Well, it's really not that hard because Jesus had been making all kinds of claims that he was God. And let me give you some, some verses. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. That's a pretty good one. Matthew 5, over and over, Jesus was saying, you have heard that it was said of old, and he says, now I say to you, speaking with an authority, that only God should have. Even the title that he uses for himself, Son of Man, comes from Daniel chapter 7, where that title is used of God coming down from heaven in the cl clouds. After being accused or railed because he was healing on the Sabbath, this is what Jesus said, My father is working until now, and I'm working. This was why the Jews were seeking to kill him. That's what the text says. All the more because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. And then in uh, Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27, he writes, all things, all things have been handed over to me by my father, and no one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son, and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him to. So Jesus has been pretty bold, is saying, you need a bigger concept of God because I'm God. Now, for the Jew, every day they woke up and they said, Hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you should love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was their testimony. Christians say that there are, there's one God who exists in three distinct eternal personalities. Muslims hear that and they say, uh, Christianity doesn't believe in one God. They're, they're wrong. They believe in three gods. We do not. So in this text, um, I think uh, rather than me try to explain it, let me read you what R.C. Sproul writes. I've got a lot of quotes today. That's why I've got to stand here. In Psalm 110, David writes of a conversation in which God invites David's Lord 
to sit in the seat of highest authority. That much is clear. Still, we have not answered Jesus' question. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? In other words, how can David describe one of his descendants as greater than himself? In Jewish categories, the son was always subordinate to his father. The son was never greater than the father. And by that reasoning, as marvelous as the Messiah would be, if he was to be David's son, he could not be greater than David. Yet David himself calls him his son my Lord, indicating that Jesus is not simply the son of David. He is David's sovereign. Now, I think one of the things that, that made the crowd enjoy this was because all the teachers at this point were going, uh, 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 we don't know. We don't have an answer to that. That's a passage that they don't like. And we, we all have passages that we have a hard time with. But this one was especially troubling because you don't, you don't go up to your son usually and say, sir, could um, you help me out here? No, that's usually, it, it reverses. It goes the other way. And that's David's, that's Jesus' argument. That David is saying, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, and he's looking up at both of them. So this is a, a really tough thing here. Um, Jesus claims to uh, know Abraham. Listen to this. Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 56 through 59. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Abraham lived 4,000 years before this, okay? Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out to, of, to the, of the temple. Now, this is why this is significant. Je First of all, Jesus says that he, he knew Abraham, which means he's claiming an eternal sense of his being. But the, uh, the real incendiary part of this is that he said, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He said before Abraham was, I am. Now, to the Jews, that was especially noteworthy. Why? Because when Moses was talking to God and saying, Lord, what, when I go and tell the people that you talk to me, they're going to say, who are you? What do I tell them? Tell them, I am has sent you. My name is I am. It was such a sacred name the Jews didn't even pronounce it. And here's Jesus deliberately saying, before Abraham was, I am. It's a veiled claim that he too is God himself. <sighs> getting worn out yet? We're just getting started. All right, so what we're dealing with here is really the doctrine of the Trinity. And you've heard it. We've talked about it today. We've sung about it. We're going to sing about it again at the end. This is a belief that Christians have. A guy by the name of uh, theologian Millard Erickson says this, the doctrine of the Trinity must be divinely revealed, not humanly constructed. I like this line. It is, it is absurd from a human standpoint, so absurd from a human standpoint that no one would have invented it. We do not hold the doctrine of the Trinity because it's self-evident or logically cogent. We hold it because God has revealed that this is what he is like. We say, well, that doesn't seem very nice. Well, suppose I came home one day and said, uh, hey, I met somebody, and, and, and you would love them. They're, they're a lot like, um, well, they're really not all that much like that. Um, but, but you'd like them because their personality is similar to well, that's not really a good uh, analogy either. And so there you are. You're explaining the doctrine of the Trinity, but you're never really explaining it because we're talking about categories that are way outside of our existence. One who is three, but one? We have nothing that is like that. Uh, Jesus said that he was God. He spoke of angels as his angels. He claimed to forgive sins. He claim the right to forgive, to forgive sins. He considered the elect of God, Christians, as his children. He claimed the power to judge the world from Matthew 25 and to reign over the world. If that's not enough, listen to this from the book of uh, Hebrews, way back in the first chapter, right off the bat. 
this guy from the Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he's spoken to us through his son. Now listen to how he's described. God has promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. You understand that? In Hebrews, they're saying Jesus is God. In uh, 1 Peter, a little bit farther back in uh, the Bible, in 1 Peter, we read this one verse that talks about all three of the uh, members of the Godhead together. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his Spirit has made you holy, and as a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know, every time we do a baptismal service, we baptize people, what? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here we have this. We are affirming the Trinity, and for the most part, we don't get it. So let, here's some things we need to keep in mind. Number one, God is different than we are. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Now, God is apart from us. He's bigger than us. He's, he's otherworldly because, well, he made the world himself. The Bible says in uh, Genesis uh, that we are made in his image. And so, like the Mormon church, they believe that made in his image means that God must have a body just like ours. And therefore, he probably was once a man. And so, we as men can eventually rise to become gods and have our own little worlds. That's, that's Mormon teaching. That's not what in his image means. In his image means that we are like him in the sense that we have the ability to think and to reason. God is way bigger than we are. Uh, Jesus told the woman at the well, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We must accept this. We must accept that uh, we're, we're blown away by him. And Jesus, in this one little statement, is trying to expand people's view of God and say, you're thinking too small about God. You've got God in a box. You need to kick out the sides of that box and realize that he is bigger and more complex and more wonderful than we could possibly understand. Second, we need to keep in mind that any attempt to try to explain the Trinity is going to fail. Have you ever heard somebody say, uh, well, the Trinity is kind of like an egg. You know, you've got the shell, you've got the yolk, you've got the white. No, the Trinity isn't like that. Uh, Trinity is kind of like water. Water can exist as water, steam, and ice. But, but at different times. The Trinity states that, that all the members of the body of Christ, uh, the, the Godhead, are eternally existent. They don't move from, God doesn't like put on a different mask when he needs to do something different. All three of the members of the Godhead eternally exist and are one together. I think sometimes that the, the thing that helps me the most is to think about um, marriage and think how two become one. We talk about that. And when we're married, two people become one. And, and we know that they don't, like, merge together. It's the sense that they start becoming people who are after the same goals and they start um, enjoying kind of the same things. But even that's a lousy illustration. Why? Because I don't know about you, you guys, but um, I've had a lot of people in my office who have demonstrated the fact that maybe we're not as one as we should be as they're screaming at each other. Um, so that oneness is imperfect. It's, 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 it's what we're striving for, to be one in marriage. When you have children, they know that they will try to play one parent against the other. Don't they? Okay, if I, if I want to do this, I ask dad, because dad will say yes. If I want to do this, I got to ask mom, because mom will say it's okay. And then I can go to the other one and say, well, they said it was okay, right? That's, that's we're played. So that oneness is imperfect. But there is that sense in which the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one like that, except perfect. There is no, there is no disagreement. There's no debate amongst them. They are working in perfect harmony. In, um, in the Bible, we see sometimes that 
They submit to each other. Listen to this from Philippians 2 about Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He put it aside. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. It's important that we understand that when we see members of the Godhead submitting to each other, that's a role that they're playing at that time. It does not mean that they're less in value. It doesn't mean that they're not equal with each other. And so it's important that we get that as well. The function of one member being subordinate to the other does not mean that there's an inequality between them. So, I'm sure some of you are saying, he should have had his hip surgery earlier. <laughs> but then Rick would have been talking to you about this. We're, we, that's what we do. We go through passages like this. And, and Jesus um, is kind of really going after these spiritual leaders, isn't he? Uh, beware of them. They like to parade around in flowing robes, receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces, how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and head tables at the banquets. He's saying, you guys are all about the show. You need to think more about who God is because he's bigger than you understand. So why is this important? Well, number one, it's important because our God is generally, is bigger than we generally think of him as being. Listen to this, uh, Pastor Dan Kimball. He did a survey and spent years interviewing people regarding their perceptions of Jesus Christ. And in his book, They Like Jesus But Not the Church, Insights from Emerging Generations, he chronicles the positive but ill-informed perception of Jesus in modern culture. Most people understand Jesus as a peacemaker who loved others and died for what he believed in. They think of him as a rebel who fought for the poor and oppressed and stood against religious hypocrites. Kimball discovered that though people claimed to know Jesus, they didn't know him at all. And that's what's happening in our society today. We live in a society where people like Jesus, but it's the Jesus of their imagination. It's not the Jesus who has come down from heaven to save his creation. C.S. Lewis um, once said, if you can look at me, talking about Jesus, if you can look at me and talk to me and walk away saying, okay, okay, he is a good teacher, I can learn from him. He's inspirational. Jesus would say, I am not inspirational. I am devastating. If you just use me to get over the humps in your life, if you use me as an example, if you use me as somebody to refer to when you're in trouble, you've put me in a little box. I am breaking out. I am not a mere mortal. I am the judge of the earth. I am eternal, the eternal high priest. I am the way to God. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you're going to have life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father th but through me. That's outrageous. But that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, I'm breaking out of the box. You're not hearing me unless you take evasive action. Choose this day who you will serve. See, he says, who's David's son? This is David's Lord. How can you think the Messiah is a mere mortal? I am he. I'm not a mere mortal. I am not a mere political leader. I'm not the Messiah you want I'm the Messiah you need. I'm the Messiah you have. Therefore, change. Jump up. Be afraid. Hate me or love me and serve me utterly and build your entire life around me. I will not allow you to do anything in the middle. He was outrageous. He was in our face. And that was Jesus' concern about the religious leaders, that they, they were just treating him as nothing, and they were missing the grandeur of God the second thing I think we draw from the doctrine of the Trinity is that God is deeply invested in our relationship with him. Think about this. The creator of the universe who has been rebelled against, who has been ignored, who has been uh, riled and ridiculed, agreed to have the son come down to earth and become a man to save people like us. That's a staggering thing. Jesus was not just some guy who cared about us. Jesus was God himself who came down to do what only God himself could do for us. It's a startling thing. Have you ever been loved like that before? You can't say yes because none of us have. None of us have ever been loved with that kind of depth 
And God is saying, I want you as my own. I want you to be my child. I know you don't understand the Trinity. Nobody does. But I want you to know that the Godhead loves you. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit want to be a part of your life, and we want to make you one with us. Not in the sense that you'll be God, but the sense that we will be related to, other, to each other for eternity. What a great thing. It's a, uh, you know, Jesus in John chapter 3, right after the verse that we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he said, I have not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. That's why he came. He didn't come to knock our heads together and say, hey, you guys, stop it. We're ticked off up here in heaven, and if you don't get your act together, we're going to wipe you out. He could have. But instead, he said, I came to save you, to give you a life that's worth more than you could ever comprehend. Finally, this means that when Jesus talks, we should hear his words with the same kind of authority that came down from Mount Sinai. We all know the Ten Commandments. We know we're supposed to, to do those things. And somehow we think those maybe are, are more important than the things that Jesus said, but they're not. Because they're all coming from the same place. They're all coming from God Almighty. So when Jesus tells us that we are to love one another, he's not saying, I'm, I'm going to put this in the suggestion box. You know, if you guys would like, boy, it would be great if you love each other. He's not doing that. He's commanding us to love one another. You know, when, when Jesus, we, we hear all the time, that the Lord invites us to come and be part of his family. He doesn't really invite us. He commands us to be part of his family. He says, come, come, come and be forgiven. Believe in me, trust in me. We need to hear those words with the authority that they speak and the power that's in them, which means that every promise that Jesus makes is backed by the throne of heaven. He will hold us fast. He will work in us. And if we will let him, he will build in us. Maybe we'll, we'll never understand the doctrine of the Trinity. We might not even understand it in heaven. I don't care. It doesn't matter whether I get it or not. All I know is what he tells me, that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all concerned about us. And they want us to know them. And once we do, we will find a security unlike anything else this world can give to us. So let's pray together. Father, we confess that we are befuddled. Um, you're stretching our minds. You're expanding our vocabulary with some of these things. And we're almost afraid to go out into the world and say that God came to us in the form of Jesus. But that's what you did. Help us, Lord, to understand that. And to read the Bible not as a, a book of moralisms or um, just stories. Help us to read it as the account of your attempt to reach out to us. So help us to respond. Help us to stop running away from you and instead to run towards you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude today with a song. You know, I, I would have normally said, let's conclude with holy, 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 but those of you who were here last week know that we sang holy, holy, holy instead of the song that we were going to sing. So this week, I'm just going to ask you to stand, and let's sing the doxology. It's, it's the affirmation of what we're just talking about. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Seated, we're going to answer some questions. Wouldn't it be great if the first question was, Can you explain the doctrine of the Trinity? <laughs> no. That's right.
But speaking of questions that we may not be able to answer. Oh, good. <clears throat> that won't keep us from talking about That's it. That's right. <laughs> uh, all right, so this question says, will people get saved after the rapture? For example, if someone grew up in the church and has a head knowledge of faith, but has never made a decision to, tr to trust in Christ, then when the rapture happens and they see that it's really real, will they have the opportunity to become saved and go to heaven will they, when they die, or will they have missed their chance? <laughs> that seems like that should be a really easy answer. Um, but here's why it's not. We are living in a day when uh, what would be called, and we won't get into the big words, there's a certain view of the end times that's prevalent today. And it's been prevalent for the last 150 years or so. and became really popular with the um, Schofield Reference Bible, mm -hmm. the very first you know, Bible study Bible. And they, they came out with a particular view of the end times and a particular way of interpreting um, Revelation. And so they've got this map, and it's, it's called dispensationalism. But for 1,800 years before that, um, there were a lot of other views of the book of Revelation. And so it's not as easy as we think. Uh, and the book of Revelation is not as easy to understand. Have you tried reading that? Um, it, it's tough. But we've got a lot of popular teachers today, and they're all coming from like the same school. A lot of them came out of Dallas Seminary, uh, which is a big proponent of this. And we're not, we wouldn't say that they're wrong. We're just saying it's just one opinion. And that opinion is that there will be a secret rapture that takes place before the tribulation and the millennium, both of which are affirmed in the book of Revelation. But the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book, which means that it's got a lot of symbols in it, and we don't know which are symbols and which are literal. <laughs> um, people ask, why haven't we preached on the book of Revelation yet? because it would be a lot like today's sermon week after week after week. <laughs> and people would come out going, I'm more confused now than I ever was. So it's not as easy an answer. If you take that viewpoint, um, I think it would say that if, we're take, if, Christ, if Christians are taken out of the world and the Holy Spirit is removed, which would create some problems, if the Holy Spirit isn't there, People can't get saved because it's the Holy Spirit that brings people to repentance and to new life. But if we're just taken out, then, then there may be some people who look at it and say, look, I've heard people say that there's going to be a rapture. Boom, everybody's gone. It must be right. Hmm, I better get my act together. So I think that people could be saved. Yeah, so to, I guess, elaborate on that, the other view of, uh, the other way to view this is there's this idea that there's this rapture where Christians are taken out of the world and then there's this period of tribulation, um, and then Christ returns at the end of that. Uh, the other way to view that is to say that the time when Christians are taken out of the world is the time when Christ returns. So either there's two returns or there's just one return. Um, obviously, if there's just one return, then this is a moot point. But if there are two returns, um, and if that occurs prior to the tribulation, and I realize... I want you to notice that I'm saying if a lot here, right? Because we don't know. We're just um, burying you like crazy today, aren't we? <laughs> but if that happens before the tribulation, uh, then there's a passage in uh, Revelation chapter 7 where it talks about uh, these martyrs coming into heaven who were martyred during the tribulation. Well, if the Christians have all been taken out of the world at that point, and there are people who are being martyred for their faith, seems to me that they must have had to become Christians during the tribulation. So is that possible? It would seem that it's possible if that view is correct. Let me get to the practical part of this. <laughs> um, ultimately, I think what we see here is we shouldn't bank on a second chance to trust in Christ. Um, because First of all, if Christ only returns once and there's not this whole secret thing, that's it. The second thing is, if you die, that's it. And, and we don't know when our time on this earth is up. And so to say, I'm going to put off what is literally the most important decision, not only of my life, but of eternity, 
until, you know, some later date in the hopes that I'll get a second chance at that point is the height of foolishness. Uh, and so we have a responsibility to make sure that we're confident of where we are um, prior to that time. And then, you know what? We don't have to worry about it. Yeah, don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, if you have a to-do list and you've, you've gone all these management things, you, know, you, you, you put down the things and you rate them A, B, C, D, and put them in order, try to get the A's done, you try to get the B's done, the C's, pfft, you know you're never going to get to those. Um, number one should be get right with God. Every day, that should be on your to-do list. Get right with God or to uh, nurture my relationship with God because we don't know when Jesus is going to come for us, either in a rapture or whether he comes for us when we die or something else. You know, accidents happen and people, people don't expect that this is going to be the last day of their life. Nobody does. So don't, we can spend a lot of time debating what's going to happen we should be praising God that something is going to happen. He's going to come back. He said that over and over again, I'm coming back to get you, and that I will take you to the place that I prepared for you. So, And quite frankly, I really think that's the message of Revelation is uh, for us to see Jesus comes back. Jesus is victorious. We ought to be on his side. I know that much about the book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah. You got more on that? No. Okay. Neither. I said a lot more than I really knew. I was anyhow, we, so. We've clearly exhausted our knowledge on that, anyhow. Uh, all right. Uh, the next one says, "Why did the disciples not know that Judas was the betrayer when Jesus gave him the bread?" You know, at the Last Supper. I mean, if, if you know the story, what was it? Uh, Peter asked John to ask Jesus who the betrayer was, and Jesus said, "The one that I give the bread to." And then he gave it to Judas and said, um, go do this quickly. So why didn't all those guys just jump Judas? Hey, he's the guy. Let's get him. There are other answers, but my simple mind, I say, maybe it was more than just the disciples that were there. But imagine having your family over for Thanksgiving dinner. And somebody says something. It may be as outrageous as, one of you will betray me. And now everybody's going, I don't know you. And you say, why did we miss that? I sometimes can't hear the person that's next to me at Thanksgiving dinner, much less the people that are on the other parts of the table. So it's very possible that John was the only one who heard this conversation because he was close enough to hear it. Everybody else was doing something else. Uh, and as we said, there's multiple ways to try and think through this. Uh, I thought that um, maybe they, they didn't understand that Jesus meant that you're going to betray me like right now. <laughs> um, because it says that they saw Judas get up and leave and they assumed, because you know, Jesus said, go do what you must. Judas handled the money. They figured, oh, there must be some money thing that Jesus told them to do. Um, and so I think it's possible that they didn't know because they, they were all concerned that it was going to be them. And uh, Jesus says, go, go do that. Um, Another little wrench that was thrown into this uh, by a pastor friend of mine the other day, we were, somehow this came up, and uh, he pointed something out to me that I've never seen in all of my times of reading the book, the Gospel of John. At the end of the Gospel of John, um, Jesus uh, restores Peter on the beach. There's that whole thing of, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. And he does that three times. And then at the end of that, Peter turns to Jesus and says, so am I the one who's going to betray you? I went, I never saw that before. Uh, and so I think there's a couple possibilities. Um, one is I think Peter was really aware of himself and recognized that he uh, had the potential to betray the Lord. Um, I think it's possible even maybe they didn't know what Judas had done at this point. Maybe they didn't realize what had gone on. I always assumed they knew right away. Maybe not. Um, I don't know. But uh, whatever the case is, uh, the disciples all were very concerned about their own failures, and I think they were in touch with the fact that they might betray Jesus, and that was their primary concern, um, which maybe there's a lesson there for us. That's what I was going <laughs> to say, too. Yeah. Look more at ourselves than we do yeah. at other people. But, um, but whatever the case is, uh, they all seem to be surprised when, uh, when Judas did betray Jesus, and... Um, and again, we, it's been interesting with The Chosen because, you know, we all know Judas as the bad guy. 
we forget Judas walked with these guys for three years and yeah, did we the like same them. things as them. Uh, and so I think they didn't, they didn't expect one of them to do what, what was done. Uh, and so I think it was hard for them to, to anticipate mm -hmm. that. I don't have anything else. Okay. Hey, I think this one's an easier one. <clears throat> I love our church. Yay. We'll just end there. Uh, <laughs> I love our church. Uh, how do I introduce our church to other people and encourage them to come? The world is changing, as you know. And uh, there, there used to be a day where you just say, hey, you want to come to church with me? And everybody go, oh, I've got to go to church someplace. People don't go to church anymore. A lot of people. They don't, they don't have any faith at all. And um, so I think our tactics have to change a little bit. And maybe what we need to be doing is saying to people, hey, um, can I share with you something that was really important to me? Something I heard this week. Or where would you hear that? Well, I heard it at my church. Um, well, what do they do in church? How would you answer that? Well, we sing, we, we visit, we have potlucks, you know, that's what we do in church. How enticing would that be? Ooh. But if you say, we, we study the Bible and uh, we go through it very systematically. Really? Um, and that's interesting? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's about, what, what is it, put a, put a rock in their shoe. Um, just, just say something that would help people to think about what's going on in their life right now. Um, we've got the advantage of saying, you know, if you'd like to visit our church sometime, you don't have to come with me. You can watch us online. Uh, we've got a, a streaming channel, uh, which is only us preaching, but uh, you can pick whatever sermon you want. You can find us on YouTube. You can listen to us on the radio. You can get online, listen to a radio broadcast on, on our website. Uh, you can read the sermon archive. You can, you, can, you can find out about the church without ever having to come here. Now, the goal is we want them to come in because the fellowship together is where we grow and, uh, and share something. We got the guys on Wednesday morning are really good at saying, um, let's invite somebody to Bible study because it's, it's less threatening than coming into a big church where you don't know what you're supposed to do. And uh, it would be valuable if you said, I'll meet you at the church, and then you can sit next to them and say, okay, we're going to stand now. When I was in uh, high school, when I first started to preach, 16 years old, I wasn't even driving, so it was down in near Princeton, and um, my grandfather and my uncle would drive me to these two churches. And the church in Lamoille... They, would sit, they sat like in the fifth row back, thinking that that would be good. That, that turned out to be the front row um, because of it sits in the back. So every time they would stand for the hymn, they'd be sitting there and looking around. Oh, we'd stand up, and then everybody would be sitting, and they're still standing. And it was very awkward. And that's how people feel when they come into a church. They feel this is, this is a foreign territory. I don't, I don't know what this is like, especially if we're reaching out to non-church people, which is what we should be trying to do. So just be sensitive, invite them, uh, meet them here, um, share things that you're learning. I, I'm sure I missed some things. Um, even, even the youth and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and ultimately, you know, the biggest thing that uh, research has shown is that most people don't show up at a church uh, because they go, oh, this sounds like a really neat place to go. Uh, most people don't show up at a church because of an encounter they've had with the pastor. Uh, most people come to a church because they've been invited, uh, and they have a friend who is willing to to, to bring them with them. Um, again, we work hard. We want to try and be out in the community so that people actually know us. Uh, we work hard to be in the community and hope that people know us, and it's a positive <laughs> thing. Uh, but, you know... I, Ultimately, we have a responsibility to reach out to people. You have people that you're going to be able to touch that we will never encounter. Um, and yeah, we, we live in a time where uh, people would prefer to visit online first. And uh, we've had a lot of people who have joined the church who said, yeah, well, we've been watching for months, and then we decided maybe this is a place that we want to be. I think that's a good, you know, opening place. Uh, and it's not the same. Uh, we all learned during COVID. It's not the same. Uh, but it is a start, and, uh, and that's where we start. The, the rock in the shoe thing is one of those things that uh, 
uh, someone I read once talked about. He said, our goal sometimes is to put a pebble in someone's shoe, and that's it. And uh, he said, because think about this. You ever get a pebble in your shoe? You go out in the, in the driveway out here, right? And we've got all these little pea gravel. You get that in your shoe, and initially you get it in there, and you're like, oh, I've got a little rock in my shoe. And you try to get it out, but then it doesn't come out, and so you just continue for a while. But if you walk very far, eventually that little rock begins to just bug you. And you go, I have to take my shoe off and deal with the rock. And he says, that's kind of sometimes what we need to do with people spiritually. We need to point people to the truth. We're putting a rock in their shoe and then let them walk with it for a while. Trust the Holy Spirit can work in people. Um, Follow up, care for the people, but sometimes uh, all we've got to do is put that rock there and the Holy Spirit is who does the rest. So um, do our part and then trust the Lord. uh, We'll do his. You know, I... I, th- I think we've got a good thing here. I mean, I think we've got a wonderful congregation. I think we're doing some good work. And I hope you're excited about that. And I hope you tell your friends because that's the only way we're going to expand the kingdom of God. Uh, we're not going to expand the kingdom of God. God is going to expand the kingdom of God. But we're going to do our part to help him expand the kingdom. Uh, let's pray. We're out of time. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the church that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you that, that even though There's a lot of hard things in faith, things that are hard to understand. You're not afraid of the questions. And we thank you that we can ask them. We thank you that you are there to uh, hear them and to respond to them. Help us to listen, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.